welcome to worship. It's the last Sunday of March, uh, the 26th, and preceding that, the Wednesday, at least Thursday, the 24th of March, or 23rd of March. Um, I would like to just draw your attention to a couple of notices. Um, firstly, uh, this coming week, on Wednesday evening, 6 for 6.30, is our Vision Night. Of course, Vision Night is the annual congregational meeting of the church. We've already handed out all the booklets and papers. If you want any, you can get them from the office. The question and answer session has taken place, and it just remains for us to enjoy each other's company and celebrate the goodness of God on Wednesday, the 29th of March. If you haven't booked a place yet, you need to do so with haste. There are still some places around tables available, but uh, you need to book your space because there is a meal, a catered meal that evening. The second thing I'd like to draw to your attention is um, Holy Week. Now, Holy Week has a number of different services in it. It's the week preceding Easter. The first one is on Sunday, the 2nd of April, Palm Sunday. Only one service, always, on the first Sunday of the month at 9 a.m. Invited to be there. It's a great service of celebration for Palm Sunday. Secondly, during Holy Week, from Monday the 3rd until Holy Saturday, which is the 8th of April, we will have a boiler room prayer experience in the Kids Zone. And you can sign up, you can phone Stephen in the office, or you can write your name on the door. But there are slots of one hour each, each from the morning until the afternoon on uh, Monday. Third and ending on Saturday the 8th. Then there's a Teze service at 6.30 on Tuesday evening of Holy Week. That is the 4th. And on the 6th, which is Thursday, our usual, our usual Holy Communion and um, Tenebrae. Good Friday service at 9 a.m. on Good Friday morning. And then finally the Easter services, there are three. There is a sunrise service in the Nature Reserve you're welcome to come to that. And there's also an 8 and a 10 o'clock service on Easter Sunday morning, the 9th of April. So those are the notices. The other bits and pieces are in the printed intimations, which is also on the WhatsApp group and on the email. Let's listen to Felicity Bamford now as she reads from John chapter 11. Greetings to all. We are reminding ourselves today of the story of the death of Lazarus as we read from St. John's Gospel in chapter 11. We're reading first verses 1 to 3. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. We resume our reading now from verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ and the Son of God who was to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. 
when the Jews had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When he saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And our reading ends there. May the Lord bless the reading to our hearts and to our understanding. Amen. The story of the raising of Lazarus, which is in John chapter 11, has been recognized by commentators as the climax of John's gospel. Now, before some of you get as angry with me as the Pharisees always did with Jesus, let me explain. I'm not saying that the cross and the resurrection are less important than the raising of Lazarus, but what I am saying is that every Bible writer, every gospel writer, has an opportunity to arrange their gospel in a particular way. And John has arranged his gospel so that at the height, at the center point of his little book, is the resuscitation, the raising of Lazarus. The story begins, Lazarus is dead. We know that Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. We know that Lazarus was a friend uh, of Jesus together with his sisters, Martha and Mary. And Jesus used to stay at their house whenever he traveled down from his hometown in Galilee to the city of Jerusalem because Bethany, where they stayed, was just outside of the city. At first, the story of Lazarus reads like any story of so many people I have known over the years. During my ministry of 25 years, I've been part of this funeral story over and over and over again. I recognize elements familiar to those stories and also to my own story. Lazarus, whom Jesus loved, is dead. His sisters, Mary and Martha, are distraught. The mourners come. Everyone stands around. Nobody knows what to say or do. Small talk abounds and people cry. Friedrich Beekner writes the story like this. Lazarus and his two sisters lived in the town called Bethany, a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem. And according to the Gospel of John, they were among the best friends Jesus ever had. He used to drop in with them whenever he was in the neighborhood. And when he made his entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, it was from Bethany, their home, that he took off. And it was also to Bethany that he returned just a few days before his final arrest. When Lazarus died, Jesus didn't arrive on the scene until several days afterwards. But he found the sisters so broken up that they hardly knew what they were saying. With one breath, they reproached him for having come not come in time to save their brother, and with the next breath they told him they knew he could save him still. Then, for the first and only time it is recorded in the New Testament, Jesus himself broke down and wept. Then he went on to where his friend's body lay, and he brought him back to life again. Recent interviews with people who have been resuscitated after having been pronounced dead reveal that after the glimpse they inevitably have of a figure of light waiting for them on the other side, they are very reluctant to be brought back to life again. On the other hand, when Lazarus opened his eyes to see the figure of Jesus standing before him there in the daylight, he probably couldn't work out for the life of him which side he was on. There is so much in this story, and in fact, I have probably preached it every few years or so over the last 25 years. Too many important lessons to cram into one sermon. So what I would like to do 
in this recording is to analyze just four characters in the story, four characters or groups, and explain how each contributes to making the story something beautiful. The first character is Lazarus's sister Martha. Now we know Martha from previously because she was the one when Jesus came to visit who always had things to do around the house. She was preparing the meal, washing the dishes, cleaning the floor, sweeping the house, making everything just right for her special guest. She stood in contrast in the previous story with her sister Mary, who would just sit there by Jesus' feet and listen to what he had to say, making him comfortable, talking to him, and making him feel at home. Now, upon his arrival, Martha goes out to meet Jesus. She is the first one to meet him, while Mary stays at alone at home. She says to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha has confidence in Jesus' ability to do the miraculous. Even now, she says, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus responds, Your brother will rise again. Yes, says Martha, I believe in the resurrection. You see, Martha is thinking not about right now, Lazarus is dead, but one day at the end of time, all the dead will rise to life again. Jesus goes deeper. He says, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And then Martha says, yes, Lord, I believe. Martha recognizes Jesus. She knows he is the Messiah. She knows he can raise the dead. She, she is a believer. She will be a faithful witness. Martha doesn't need proof. Martha believes. That's the ultimate level of faith. To have a Martha faith, a faith that doesn't need convincing. And then there is Mary. Now Mary is identified in the gospel, in this story, as the same Mary who anointed Jesus' feet with perfume and dried his feet with her hair. Mary stays at home when the news comes of Jesus' arrival. She doesn't run out like her sister to meet him in, in Bethany. Mary is called by her sister to come and meet Jesus. When she meets Jesus with the Jews, so-called, who followed her, she repeats her sister's words. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But Jesus does not respond like he did with Martha. Jesus notices her crying and it moves him. In her commentary on John chapter 11, the well-known New Testament scholar Sandra Snyders writes, Mary's function in the narrative is to weep, and Jesus joins her in her sorrow. There is no consolation for Mary in an explanation. And we often find this with grieving families. There's nothing you and I can say to make them feel better about the heartbreaking thing that has happened to them. Mary's statement is that of every believing Christian in history, writes Snyders, who is overcome with sorrow at the death of a loved one, who believes firmly that God could have prevented the death and yet now clings in bewilderment to the source of consolation, who is paradoxi paradoxically also the one who permitted the death. Why is Mary crying? Mary is crying because her heart is broken. Mary is crying because death is so devastating. It seems so final. And it involves a flesh and blood human being that we loved. And then the third character in the story is Jesus. Jesus, the bringer of life, let's call him. Jesus brings life. Jesus has identified himself in verse 25. He says to Martha, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And some say that's telling in advance the story of his death that would come on the cross of Calvary and that we will discuss at Easter time. But some say that he said that because he wanted to refer to what was going to happen to Lazarus just now in this story. 
People read a nonchalance into Jesus' action around the death of Lazarus. They think Jesus just came swanning in when Lazarus was long dead. He felt no urgency about what happened. And he thought everybody should just know that Lazarus' life would come back with a click of Jesus' finger. That's not what the story tells. Jesus hears of the illness. He delays his coming. Jesus comes in and makes claims in response to Martha's grief. But Jesus' response to Mary reveals his own grief about death in general and about the death of his friend Lazarus in particular. Listen to what happens when Jesus sees and hears Mary. Greatly troubled and moved is the way the Bible translates it. It's a Greek word. Ene brim esato. It is a, a feeling you get in the pit of your stomach when you're about to burst into tears. When something so terrible has happened that your heart goes down into your gut. Your splunkna in Greek, your gut. And then the shortest verse in all the scripture. Jesus wept. Sandra Snyder puts it like this. Jesus, in his most fully human moment in the gospel, legitimates human agony in the face of death. An agony he will feel for himself as he shrinks from the passion in John 12. He's just about to discover that he is a death sentence. And the same feeling in the pit of his stomach is the feeling he feels at the death of Lazarus, his friend. Jesus is as broken as Mary, as broken as you and I will be, and the tears flow. And then the final group in this particular passage. In fact, it's in verse 53 that we get the, the terrible um, emphasis on what this group is all about. The group is identified as the Jews or the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the temple priests that were threatened by the presence of Jesus. In verse 53 of chapter 11 we read, So from that day on they plotted to kill him. Sandra Snyder says, The end of the narrative is the supreme irony of the fourth gospel. The religious authorities decide to kill Jesus. Why? Because he gives life. Yet his execution would be his glorification. And the final revelation of the, of the resurrection and the life. They actually want to kill the one who brings life. What would your response be? And what on earth is the moral of the story? The story of the resuscitation or bringing back to life of Lazarus. The story is about the maelstrom that emerges when someone dies. The feelings that we feel. The arguments we have with ourselves in our head, the rationalizations that we make, the people we want to blame when there's no one to blame for death at all. Lazarus, a good friend of Jesus, is dead. The whole family and the whole community is affected. Martha's faith is strong. She knows Jesus can save Lazarus. She knows on the last day Lazarus will be raised to life again. She believes in the power of Jesus to assure Lazarus' ultimate and eternal safety. Mary, on the other hand, is heartbroken. She does not think as much as she feels, and there's nothing wrong with that. Mary and the Jews who are with her, the people, the mourners, the family, the friends, they're all heartbroken, and Jesus is moved by their grief. And in his tears, his humanity and his love for his friend are revealed. But there is a great story here. Jesus, the life-giver, is on the scene. He who calls himself the resurrection and the life makes sure that Lazarus is raised to life again. Of course, the last party in the story, as mentioned before, were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the religious leaders of the, the day, the Georges of the world. They are, they find Jesus dangerous. They're threatened by him. And they believe that he needs to be put to death. He's just too much of a loose cannon. He's upsetting the, the boat. 
is rocking uh, the world that we live in. We can't have such people around. God has greater plans to accomplish, greater evil to unmask, and a greater redemption to unveil. Let me finish with this little piece, a beautiful piece by the journalist and writer Malcolm Muggeridge, who describes the paradox that lies at the intersection of life and death, the paradox that lies ahead for all of us, you and me. You know, it's a funny thing that when you're as old as I am, 75 and near to dying, the queerest thing happens. You often wake up about two or three in the morning and you find yourself half in and half out of your body, a most peculiar situation. You can see your battered old carcass there lying between the sheets, and it's quite a toss-up whether you resume full occupancy and go through and yet another day or make off to where you see, like the lights in the sky, as you're driving along the lights of Augustine's City of God. In that sort of limbo, between being in and out of your body, you have the most extraordinary confidence. A sharpened awareness that this earth of ours, with all its inadequacies, is an extraordinarily beautiful place. That the experience of living in it is a wonderfully unique experience. And that relations with other human beings, human love, human procreation, work, all these things are marvelous and wonderful, despite all that can be said about the difficulty of our circumstances. And finally, a conviction passing all belief that as a participant in this, in his purpose, for his creation, and that those purposes are loving and not malign, creative and not destructive, universal and not particular. In that confidence is an incredible comfort and an incredible joy. Let's pray. For those who grieve, we pray for hope. For those who linger on the edge of death, frail and ready to go home, Pray for the, a smooth passing and the, the, the joy of arrival. For those who have experienced tragedy, for whom small children and adults in the full flower of youth have been taken away too early. We pray for your mercy and your healing. But for all of us who face death, because we all will, we pray for that great consolation, the hope that we are always safe with you. You are the resurrection and the life. Amen.